Let's get this sports podcast party started, all right? The J Reels Podcast. What is happening, Michael? People, greetings. How are you? How's it going? How's everybody doing out there? What is the latest and greatest? Hope everybody's doing well, feeling fantastic, in excellent spirits. With Mother's Day on the horizon, an early happy Mother's Day wish to you all out there. And another podcast that I'm grateful to sit here and host on everything that's going on in sports as this is the J Reels Podcast with your host J Reels. For my first time, as welcome aboard. And for those who've been banging with me going back to the very beginning, somewhere in the middle or even as early as this past Monday, I welcome you guys and gals back. And I'm going to start off this podcast with a little bit of a different twist. Of course, I go through my sports. If you've listened over the last three, four weeks with the playoffs, and how I'll go through the NBA, NHL, and obviously I will do that. But for whatever the reason, after watching the Nick game last night, and knowing that the Knicks are up 2-0 on the Indiana Pacers, as well as the Rangers, the hockey team, who also reside at MSG, Madison Square Garden that is, the world's most famous arena, where they'll have a Game 3 tonight in Carolina, and for whatever the reason, it just brought me back to a time. And when I think about it, it might as well felt like 30 days ago, let alone 30 years ago. Because if you live in the New York area, and Lord knows, I am neither a Nick fan or Ranger fan. So I don't want you to think that, oh boy, here goes Jay Reels. He's from New York. I'm sure he's going to break out the pom-poms, whether they're red, white, and blue for the Rangers or blue and orange for the Knicks. Yes, I do bleed blue and orange, but for the Mets and Islanders, and that's just baseball and hockey. Everybody knows I bleed green and white, and I understand that's a discussion for another day, or you could even go back in the archives for one of the podcasts in 2020 when we had the pandemic, and me discussing my sports teams and why I pledge allegiance, in this case when it comes to basketball, to the Boston Celtics, but that's for another time, or like I said, you could just go back in the annals and dig that one out, but it did bring me back to that spring of 94, and everything that encompassed the... Spring and summer, where both teams went to finals. The Rangers had the long cup drought, 1940 at that time, 54 years. And for them to beat the Canucks in seven games, where they actually had a 3-1 series lead. And this was on the heels of what happened in the conference final against the Devils, one of the more classic game sevens that you could ever watch in any sport. And I'm sure it's on YouTube. You could definitely go back and check on that. It was a Friday, I believe, off the top of my head, May 27th, if I'm not mistaken, 1994. And I'll never forget, I was watching that, crazy as this may sound, with my ex-girlfriend at the time. Now, mind you, 30 years, so you know we're going way back. And just knowing that Mike Richter, Martin Brodeur were making save after save, they were both heroic in that game. Until Stefan Matteau, who obviously in this area is a legend, and of course the call by Howie Rose, if you recall, where the goal, as he came around the net, and he just squeaked it by and sputtered right past the pad of Martin Brodeur across the goal line into the net, and he just yelled out, Matteau, Matteau, Matteau. And that was, again, one of the great Game 7s that you'll ever see in any sport. But thinking back last night, especially with the Knicks and their run, how they got to a final and how they played the Pacers in the conference final where Patrick Ewing had that follow-up dunk, if you recall, which punctuated their trip to the finals where they played the Houston Rockets. And even prior to that, they had a seven-game series against the Bulls, minus Michael Jordan. But you had that infamous series where Scottie Pippen, who decided not to go in in the final, what was it, 1.8 seconds, and then Tony Kukoc hit the game winner, I believe that was in game three, and then you had the Hugh Hollins, remember that, the foul on Hubert Davis, where Scottie Pippen just grazed Hubert Davis, and he had to go to the free throw line for three free throws, and that was controversial, mind you, this was pre-replay, so you didn't have a scenario where you could go to the monitor, or go to the compound there, I guess downtown Manhattan or even in Sea Caucus, New Jersey, where they could review that. And then, of course, you had that big dunk by Scottie Pippen over Patrick Ewing in Game 6 and then Game 7, which was anticlimactic. It was a Sunday, and if I recall, that may have been, what, May 22nd, if I'm not mistaken, because then the following Friday was the Stefan Matogol, 
the Game 7 against the Devils, and then the Knicks, who then went to a final, and they lost a tough Game 3 after splitting the first two games in Houston, and for the Knicks to lose Game 3, but then they won Game 4 and 5, and Game 3, if I recall, that was the Sam Cassell game where he was unconscious and had the Rockets go up in the Series 2-1, but then, how can anyone ever forget and this date is right on point, June 17th, 1994, Game 5 of the Finals. And that was the infamous OJ, Al Cowlings, on the freeway somewhere in the L.A. vicinity. Him driving away from the police, going to his home in Brentwood. And we all know what happened after that, where the nation was captivated. Pretty much not halted what happened at Madison Square Garden. But at the same time, it overshadowed a pivotal Game 5 where the Knicks did win, and then they went to Houston. We know about the John Starks game in Game 7, 2 for 18, 0 for 11 from 3. Actually had a great Game 6 where he had an opportunity to win the game, but was blocked, I believe, by Otis Thorpe at the end of Game 6. And then, of course, the coronation there by the Houston Rockets, the first of back-to-back -back NBA championships for them. And the Knicks were unable to do what the Rangers did and win a Stanley Cup as they did, what was that, I guess a few days prior. In fact, they did win their Stanley Cup on a Tuesday, June 14th. So that was actually the day before game number four at Madison Square Garden. So it was just a wild spring leading into the summer. Obviously, the long-awaited parade by the Rangers, them finally getting the monkey off their backs, or the piano off their backs, I should say. And for the Knicks, they fell that short and winning an elusive NBA championship, which at the time would have been 21 years. And now, here we are, 51 years later, could it possibly be? Now as we fast forward to today, and even to last night, and I'll start there with the Knicks, and then I'll get to the Rangers, and then I'll unpack what's going on in both sports. But the Knicks now have a 2-0 series lead, heading to Indiana, and what these two games boil down to, and I understand we can talk about the calls. Now the Pacers last night, have made a complaint to the league where they missed the officiating, that is, 78 calls in game two. Really, did they have somebody chart or monitor each and every call that was missed throughout the course of the game? And to me, that's gamesmanship. That is going to be a precursor for game number three where the whistle will probably benefit the Pacers, at least for the next game. I don't know if it's going to be for the two games in Indiana, but dating back to last night and even... Game one on Monday, all you need to know is this about the series. The Knicks showed a lot more grit, a lot more toughness. They showed a lot more metal. And the finesse team that the Pacers are doesn't necessarily translate to success. And even though the bad game won by Tyrese Halliburton scoring six points, and yesterday had 22 first half points, ended with 34, but a quiet 34 overall because in the second half, he was pretty much invisible. And with Jalen Brunson out, with a foot injury, and I thought it was probably worse. It looked like he was holding his groin. But for him not to be in the second quarter, and the Pacers had a 10-point lead at halftime, and what happened? A la, I don't want to say Willis Reed, 1970, which the irony of that was the anniversary yesterday, May 8th, 1970, 54 years ago, where Willis Reed came out of the tunnel during the warm-up, had the two big jump shots early on in the game, and the Knicks went on to win an NBA championship, the first one in their franchise's history. Now, of course, different set of circumstances, but Brunson, as we all know, is the team MVP. And for him coming out, and the Knicks certainly just took off from there, had a big run there in the third quarter, and then down the stretch of the game where Brunson was showing his toughness, and OG Anunobi, who left with a hamstring injury, and that's going to be a key injury moving forward, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But he made a huge contribution in the first half with 22 points. Add in Dante DiVincenzo, add in Josh Hart, the Villanova Knicks, as we know. And Isaiah Hartenstein, always with contributions left and right from the offensive glass, big time putbacks, etc. And the Knicks are up 2 0. And that's what it boils down to. We could go back to game one. Why? It's pretty much the same thing when you look at what happened there down the stretch of game one. And the Knicks right now are on a magic carpet ride. And I know the fan base is geeked up, as they should be, and I understand this is a long time coming for this fan base, but there is a little bit too much bravado when I'm hearing that, oh, the Knicks are back, or oh, that the Knicks bring on Boston, which you heard more in the first round than you have here, 
And I think Nick Celtics would be fascinating. And I think we're going to be heading in that direction, which I'll get into also a little bit later on. But when we look at this Nick team, they are not only clicking on all cylinders, but it's all being carried by their point guard, number 11. And the thing that just boggles my mind when I watch Brunson play, and this is now even up close and personal more so. Regular season, of course, in and out of these games. I'm not watching every Nick game throughout the course of the season. But now I've had a very good look at him throughout the course of this postseason. And we could go back to last year, and I know what's haunting him is that turnover where in Miami, as they needed that game six in the worst way, and they were down by two with 20 seconds to go, and he threw the ball out of bounds, and he had a similar scenario, if you recall, in game five against the Sixers in the first round. But of course, they were able to withstand that and beat the Sixers. But for Brunson, a guy who is, what, 6'1", with heels on, and I'm not talking high heels, people. You want to talk about, I don't know, Prince heels, boots, whatever, Timberlands, let's go that route. Or a guy that isn't fast, not quick, but for whatever the reason, finds his spots and knows how to draw fouls. And the guy is fearless. He'll take any shot anywhere. He'll go into the paint. He'll go to the basket. He'll take the three. He'll take the mid-range jumper. The guy has an arsenal that a lot of players in the NBA, whether it's the wings, bigs, or even guys his size, do not have that type of game. Yes, you could say Chris Paul once upon a time, but we know Chris Paul right now is in the twilight of his career. But for Brunson, he is literally carrying this team on his back. If he didn't come back in this game last night, this series would have been deadlocked at one. And just his warrior mentality, as a lot of people, as you've seen there in the post game yesterday, he is really showing and proving how a small guy may be diminutive in size, but his heart and his testicular fortitude is as big as the Empire State Building. And here's the one thing. I don't want to throw cold water, but the one thing that you have to ask yourself, Nick fans, is this sustainable? And this is even without him getting injured last night with that foot because he's going to have to log big-time minutes, same for DiVincenzo, same for Josh Hart, etc. And for this Nick team, if they're trying to get to a final for the first time since 1999, they're going to have to log some serious minutes. It's not as if you're going to have 36, 38-minute games. He's going to be 42, 44, and even beyond. And you have to wonder, as they get deep into this postseason, and right now it's looking like they're going to beat the Pacers, I think the Pacers are going to respond here, I would for sure in Game 3, because of everything I said regarding the 78 complaints with the calls yesterday. And you can even go back to Game 1. I know Aaron Neesmith knocked the ball out of bounds with his hand, and he thought it was a kick ball. They couldn't review it. And then you had the... Miles Turner, which was a joke because that's a spot where you have to swallow the whistle. It wasn't egregious. DiVincenzo also acted on that. So you want to give him an Academy Award or a Tony, whatever you can. But he sold it and the refs bought. But for the Pacers, I would think game three, not to say it's an automatic, but you would think they'll get back in the series. It's just a matter of whether they get game four. Because down the stretch of these games, they do not match the intensity and certainly when it comes to the 50-50 balls, the rebounds, etc., they cannot go mano a mano with the Knicks because they got that covered here over the first two games of the series. So for the Knicks, they are in a good spot here, but you do have to take caution on the minutes that are being logged. And now with this injury, and I'm sure he is resting as we speak, or as I speak, this injury is going to be number one here in New York City and pretty much with the NBA because if he's going to be compromised here, and you know he's going to gut it out, he's going to give it all he's got, but if he's not going to be able to put up the performance that he has dating back to the Philly series and now the first two games of this series, who knows? The Nick hopes for a title could fall short. But with medicine, rest, nutrition, etc., we'll certainly see what's going to happen there. And as far as OG Ananobi goes, that is going to be a huge loss. You saw the contributions he's made so far this postseason. Even yesterday with Brunson out in that second quarter, attacking the basket, making threes, etc. And without him, whether it be for this series or if they do advance and the likelihood that they will against the Knicks, who's going to guard Jason Tatum? Who's going to guard Jalen Brown? Who's going to get those bigs? And not having a guy like Anunoby, who is that glue guy, a guy that could try to do his best to slow down the opposing wing player, that is going to be an enormous void for the Knicks if, 
and it's a hamstring right now. We don't know the severity of it. I'm sure we'll find out in the hours, maybe even a couple days from now, or who knows, maybe by the end of today, leading into game three tomorrow night. But that is going to be a significant loss if Anunoby does not come back. Maybe the Knicks will survive this series without him, but long term, they're going to need him. They're already without Julius Randle, as we know, and we understand that he's a big component of this team, but he's been long gone. You can't think about him or worry about him. But Anunoby, considering what he's been able to contribute at this point, he's a guy that if he's going to be out of the lineup for any extended period of time, more so past this series, that is going to be a big loss. All there is to it. And then on the flip side, when it comes to the Garden, the Rangers, they are now undefeated in this postseason. We could take the first round and flush it because they beat the Capitals. No big whoop there. But the Hurricanes, who are neck and neck with them in the division, and for them to be able to, I don't want to say just dispose of them like nothing because Carolina were in these games. Even the game on Tuesday night, which we talked about game one on Monday, but Tuesday night, for them to have leads and the Rangers come back, and again, it's all in their power play. They're now 4 of 9 on the power play here in this series. They've just been phenomenal when it comes to having the extra man. And Igor Shosturkin with 54 saves in that double overtime. Vincent Trocek getting a power play goal in that second frame for the Rangers to advance, or really advance to go to Carolina up 2-0. They didn't advance as yet to get to a conference final. But it's all looking good. It is... Broadway Blue Shirts, you could argue whether or not that they're the best team right now left standing here in this postseason. We got to get through some other series and other scenarios, which we'll dive into in a moment. But if you're looking at this Ranger team as loaded as they are and they have the great mix of the youth and the veteran leadership and the veteran goal scoring and have a bunch of firepower throughout this lineup, very good defense. Shesterkin, as I mentioned, who had a rough first half of his year, as I talked about when we went through the NHL throughout the course of the regular season. But pretty much since that game, the outdoor stadium series game against the Islanders, from that point on, he has been rock solid and even spectacular for that matter. So if the Rangers continue to get the contributions that they've normally gotten from the Artemi Panarins of the world, the Chris Kreiders, Vincent Trocheks, the Mika Sabanajads, as well as Adam Fox, and if Shesterkin's going to continue to play like this, who's going to beat him in the Eastern Conference? Maybe the Florida Panthers? The Bruins, you would think that the Rangers will... I would think the Bruin toughness may show up at times, and I'm not talking about toughness dating back to the 70s, and certainly not what you saw there last night with David Pasternak of all people, and you know I'm going to touch on that. But the Rangers right now, you would think that they have... I'm not going to say a red carpet to the finals, but if they do not come out of the East, even if they do play the Florida Panthers... There may need to be an investigation. That's all I'll say there. That's how good the Rangers are playing. I think Carolina, they'll get a game here. At least one. I don't know if it's going to be game three or game four. And I wouldn't be surprised if it comes back to the Garden tied at two. Because we know Carolina is a very good team. They're not a great team. And as I've talked about before, they're the type of team that has four solid lines. Very good defense. Their goaltending, eh. I didn't like the goal that Anderson gave up. I know... There was a bit of a, and that's the Trocheck goal, the overtime goal I'm referring to. I know that there was a lot going on there, a bit of a scramble, and Anderson didn't really get set when Trocheck was in front of the net right when he scored that goal, but that's a real soft goal, and I understand goaltenders are going to give up goals like that. It wasn't as if it was a label reader where you could read the NHL logo and see Gary Bettman's signature on the puck where it just goes right past him and across the goal line into the net, but for the Hurricanes... I think they could bounce back in the series. I wouldn't be surprised if it comes back to the Garden 2-2. Unlike the other series, because I think the Knicks will win one of the next two in Indiana. And to me, that's game four, which is what you saw in the previous series against the Sixers. As the Sixers bounce back from a no-2 deficit, we saw what happened there. And I could see the same recipe here for the Knicks. As far as the Rangers, I could see that too. If they win game three, the Rangers, I think they're going to sweep the Hurricanes. Maybe for pride, they'll win one game and then come back to the Garden and get set up for an execution and lose in five. But the Rangers are clicking on all cylinders. And if you ask me which one of the two teams has a better shot of getting to the finals, as it is right now, because we all know injuries could come up. So Sturgeon could go out. We don't know. But I think the Rangers have a better shot to get to a final. And the only reason why I say that is because now with Anunoby and his injury, a big question mark, and you don't know what's going to be like for... Jalen Brunson either. 
If you told me that Brunson didn't have this injury last night, could they survive without OG Anunoby? I'd say they could, but that's a guy that you're going to really need, not only to the conference final, but even to an NBA final. Who's going to guard Anthony Edwards? Who's going to guard even a guy like Michael Porter if the Nuggets got back and won the series against Minnesota? Who's going to guard a guy like Shea Gilgis-Alexander? When you're looking at players like that, or Luka, or Kyrie, Anunoby's a guy that you could just automatically plug and say, all right, that's your matchup. But without him, like I mentioned earlier, that is going to be a ginormous loss. And Brunson, we don't know about his health. If you tell me he's going to remain healthy and he's going to be as effective and productive, all right, fine. But I think the Rangers have a better shot at getting to a final than the Knicks do. And that's not throwing cold water on the Knicks. That's just the reality. And then you do have the Celtics that are looming. So you also got to figure that into the equation because I don't want to hear the Knicks fans saying, oh, well, we beat the Celtics that final week of the season up in Boston, that regular season game. All right, fine, but what happened to the other three games in the regular season, if you want to go that way? So don't even compare the regular season to the postseason. So that's a whole different animal to begin with. And Knicks Celtics, once we get there, then we'll unpack that. But that's what you have with the Knicks and Rangers, and I'm sure the feeling around here is 30 years ago, hoping that the result could be the same for the hockey team and for the basketball team, that they can reverse that. But I've laid it out for you, not only taking you back three decades ago, but also kind of putting it together as the trajectory of both franchises and where they may go. But that's why they play the games. I just give you my opinion, my thoughts, etc. And thanks for stopping by to listen to that, to see how this could possibly unfold. But you know, I'll be on top of this. And let's see if we can get anything close to what we saw 30 years ago as both of these teams look like they're going to advance to a conference final. For the Knicks, it'll be their first conference final since 2000. So think about that. It almost took a quarter of a century. Well, I'm putting a horse before or cart before the horse right now. But it looks like the Knicks are on the verge of getting to a conference final for the first time since 2000. And the Rangers, as we know, they went to a conference final two years ago before losing to Tampa in six. Now let me get to the rest of the NBA. I'll start there because we have... A very interesting storyline that's taking place in the Denver, Minnesota series. And I will say this, the NBA got it right with Jamal Murray. I understand that this was a regular season. And even though he didn't hit an official or a player, now you're not supposed to throw anything on the court because if that was a fan that did that, they'd be ejected from the arena. And in this case, Murray should have been ejected from the game. But with all that had happened there in the second quarter and then the aftermath, whether or not he was going to be suspended... And certainly that is a foul, or that is an action that should warrant a suspension. But think about it. If Denver would have won game two, and the series would have been even, the NBA would have been at least a little bit more harsh, or harsher to give Murray a one-game suspension. Because then, it would have been an opportunity. So let's say even if the T-Wolves would have won up 2-1, then you have Murray come back for game four, and it all is right in the NBA world, where now they're down 0-2. He's had a not-so-good first two games here in this series against the T-Wolves, and then you're going to put them in a situation where they could potentially go down 0-3 and then have the brooms come out for a sweep? Not going to happen. Which now brings to the bigger picture. The NBA, even the NHL for that matter, now the NHL, you had a scenario where the Panthers got back in their series against the Bruins, but... NBA more so than NHL, you have a situation here where you could have, by the end of tonight, for their series, 2-0, not even 1-1. And one of those series has the team in the Timberwolves, they had the home court the next two games, where if the Celtics and Thunder win tonight, of course, they'll have to go on the road for games three and four, and then obviously the Knicks are going to go to Indiana for the next two games. So, right, those teams can get back in the series, but... All you need is for the road team to win one of those games. And in this case, for the T-Wolves, if they win both of those games at home, the series is over. So the NBA could be looking at a barren wasteland of possibly a bunch of five-game series, maybe one six-game series when it's all said and done, and you're coming off the heels of a one-game seven, which wasn't really great between Orlando and Cleveland, and even though you had a couple of game sixes, but this has been a sluggish start here for the NBA. There's no other way to slice it. And now to get to the Knicks, excuse me, to get to the Celtics 
and Cavaliers as well as, and this is a two-pronged attack here, what you saw with both Boston and OKC, the one seeds that they are, they certainly look like that. Cleveland, coming off of that seven-game series, yeah, they tried to hang with the Celtics, try to cut the lead within 12, and I understand even a 12-point lead in the NBA is minuscule when you think about it, especially when you've seen in the previous series, Dallas come back from a 31-point deficit to take the lead before losing in that game four against the Clippers, but they cannot hang with the Celtic team, even with Porzingis not in the lineup. There's too much firepower on Boston. As you saw, they just blew their doors open, especially in the second half. Derek White, he's been unconscious in this postseason. 7 for 12 from 3, 25 points. We saw what he did there in the series against Miami. Jalen Brown with 32 points has played very good here in this postseason. And I know Jason Tatum right now, although it's under the radar, and because the Celtics are winning these games in blowout fashion, he has not performed well. 7 for 19 the other day. You have to wonder about his shooting. We get it that he can be streaky and he can have his moments, but it's being camouflaged by what Derek White has done more so than what Jalen Brown has done. But you know there's going to be a day in time where Tatum is going to have to step up here, and you would think that that's going to happen. Maybe not in this series, but certainly in the conference final and beyond. So let's see if Tatum could wake up from his slumber and get his shooting together to the point where, not to say he has to score 35 points, but yes, you want him to be a little bit more efficient from the field. Maybe he's lacking a little bit of confidence. The rest of his teammates have picked him up, so let's wait and see what's going to happen there. And then the other series, when you have Luka Doncic, who's going to be hobbled, as you saw there in Game 1, and Kyrie, who I understood carried the mail there, especially in those final three games in the Clippers series, and even to Doncic's, or Doncic's admittance, that he has to do more, he has to do better, he can't have Kyrie just shoulder the entire load. And for the Thunder, who swept the Pelicans coming off of a week of rest and preparation, and with Shea Gilders Alexander, who was second in the MVP behind Nikola Jokic, and I understand people could quibble about that, whether or not Jokic deserves that, and I would think to a certain degree he does. Third MVP in four years, congratulations to him. He's going into the Hall of Fame on roller skates. That's not going out in the limb by any stretch. But for Gildas Alexander, one seed, maybe he deserved more votes or maybe even deserved the MVP overall. But 29-9-9 for him. Just a stupendous job there as they ran away 117-95. No surprise there by the Thunder who are trying to show and prove to the NBA and their fans and even to the sports fan like yours truly, that they may be the youngest team to have a one seed and one of the, I believe they're the second youngest team in the sport, but the, to show that they belong as a one seed and to be a threat in the Western Conference, they certainly did that for one game, and tonight they could go up 2-0, same for the Celtics, so you know we'll continue to stay on top of that. But besides that, that is it with the NBA. There isn't any much else to get into or to unpack. One thing I will say, as I mentioned about the Rangers, them having a clear-cut favorite and maybe not a red carpet, the Celtics, it is all right in front of them. There would be an investigation if they do not make it to the NBA Finals. And that's not hubris. That's not me puffing out my chest, especially to the Knicks fan. But think about it. If Brunson's going to be compromised, and who knows what Ananobi, and with the Celtics, if they continue to stay healthy, I understand Porzingis, who knows what's going to happen with him as he's nursing that calf injury, but there is no excuse for this team not to get to a final. And one other thing I will say, all the credit in the world, as I mentioned, what, 15 minutes ago or so regarding Jalen Brunson, but there's no one on the Pacers that could guard him. Granted, T.J. McConnell, which was a bad move by Carlisle, he should have been in that fourth quarter, and he had every gripe toward the Knicks or maybe even toward his own coach to say, why am I not in there in crunch time considering that O'Connell is a type of guy where he's all guts and maybe not a lot of talent, but does have ability and does have that tenacity that you need in order to maybe slow down an opponent, even though Brunson is playing unconscious at this juncture is not only just the playoffs, his career overall, but there is a guy that's waiting for him in the wings. And I'm not trying to make him out to be Gary Payton, although we know he's one of the top defensive guards in the league. If it's not going to be Drew Holiday, it's going to be Derek White. Keep that in mind, Nick fans, as we, if we want to look ahead, and I know I'm kind of sort of doing that considering everything that I've laid out here over the last, whatever it is, 20 minutes, but 
Those guys are going to be waiting in the wings to try to do their best to slow or even stop Jalen Brunson. So that's what the NBA, and as far as the NHL goes, you have a scenario where last night the Panthers got back in the series after the Bruins, where the Panthers scored the opening goal, and then the Bruins just took it over from that point on to win 5-1, and it made you think, wow, they had the Panthers on their heels, the Bruins, I understand, coming off of Game 7 with the Maple Leafs, maybe a little momentum, maybe there was a little bit of that revenge factor dating back, back to the first round last year and what the Panthers did to the Bruins. But then last night you saw the Panthers get back where the Bruins scored their first goal and then the Panthers then ran away from it or ran away with it, excuse me. And then the Panthers had that incident there at 6-1 after they scored the sixth goal between Makachuk and David Pasternak, which was a farce, if you ask me. And I know Kachuk is a rugged player. He can't play that way. Once in a blue, he'll drop the gloves. Now, David Pasternak, seriously? Really? I get it that it does kind of bring you back to the old days when you see them join that one another. And then when Pasternak comes off the bench with Kachuk, they just drop the gloves and then they go at it. But really, is anybody going to go gaga? And I get it. When you're thirsting for a hockey fight, and it could be a fight between those two guys... Or if I take you back several years, not that this would ever happen in a million years, but you get my point. That's like watching a fight between Steve Eiserman and Wayne Gretzky. Now, you're going to watch it if you're a fight fan. You're going to be like, all right, well, let's see what's going to happen here. But you already know what the result's going to be. It's not going to be a great fight. It's going to be a lot of grappling, grappling and wrestling and holding. This is not Ryan Reeves, Matt Rempe of about a month or so ago, where the anticipation, where the buildup, the two biggest tough guys... In the sport, or let's say in this case with Boston and Florida, two of the toughest guys in the league. Now, I understand they played at different times, but this is not Pete Worrell, or maybe they did play at the same time, come to think of it. This is not Peter Worrell against Sean Thornton. No, this is not. This is a far cry from that. But the Panthers get back in the series. It should be intriguing as the scene shifts to Boston. Who knows? This could be a long series, I would think. It'll probably go minimum six in this case, but you would think seven. So, and I picked Panthers at six at the start of the series. So, that's with the East, as well as we talked about the Rangers earlier. Out West, the Stars, I don't know what's with them. They get off to a 3 nothing lead in Game 1 over the Avalanche, and then they just pecked away to the point where they won in overtime and won 4-3. And the Stars, I don't know, maybe they want to go the difficult route to a Conference Final or to a Stanley Cup Final because... They lost those first two games to the Vegas Golden Knights in the previous series, and then they came all the way back to take a 3-2 series lead before winning in seven. And then now you have a situation where they had a 3-0 lead, and you're thinking, all right, all is fine. Avalanche now have to scramble around after blowing out Winnipeg in the opening round, and then they just came roaring back, winning overtime, and then now you have to think whether or not the Stars are going to be able to get the equalizer tonight and see if they can go to Colorado even at one, because I will say this. I know Vegas was a defending cup champ. I know Vegas had that championship DNA, whatever. And even though they pretty much crawled to the finish line of this regular season, but this wasn't the same team from last year. And Colorado, who won a cup two years ago, I think that if they go to Colorado down 0-2, they're not winning this series. There's no way to come back from this. Do they maybe come back to Dallas tied at two? Quite possibly, they did it in the first round. Why can't they do it here? But it's not going to be sustainable for them to be down 0-2 and then to try to win a series and beat a team 4 out of 5 to go on to the next round. So I can't see that happening. And then last night, this is the problem with the Edmonton Oilers. And I've watched this team from afar and I followed them. Yesterday, they come flying out of the gate. Zach Hyman scores another goal. And you would think with a 4-1 lead, more than halfway through the second period, we get it that their defense is suspect and they're with, the goaltending with Stuart Skinner. Obviously, he's not Grant Fuhrer between the pipes. But for Edmonton, you would think that they would continue to put the pressure on Vancouver, that they would do whatever it takes to at least take this game one and take the home ice away from the Canucks. But what happens? They get a goal there late in the second period with about three minutes to go, less than three minutes, that is, Vancouver. And then what happens? 4-2 becomes 4-3, and then and that was halfway through the period. And then in a span of 39 seconds, just think back to the Islander Hurricane series of the previous round where the Islanders gave up those two goals in nine seconds in both games two and games five. 
Well, they were 39 seconds apart where the Canucks were scoring two goals to not only tie the game, but then take the lead 5-4, and the Canucks steal game one with four and answer goals and win 5-4. What does this do for Edmonton psyche? You would hope they would just erase it, throw it out, and then get back at it in game two and see if you can win a game two. That's all there is to it. This team, as we know, they're loaded offensively, and you have guys that have at least gone to conference finals. This isn't the Toronto Maple Leafs, not to knock the franchise there, but this isn't a fragile, psyche team where they can't seem to get out of their own way. But Edmonton, we've seen these kind of hiccups here along the way. And for the Oilers, they are going to need to win this game number two because I think if they lose game two, that's not to say they can't get back in the series and bring it back to Vancouver 2 nothing. But this will be the one game that if they do lose this series, or let's say even if they do take a 3-2 series lead, they lose a game six in their building and then lose game seven, they're going to look back at this game. And for Edmonton, they got to right the ship. That was a game that they had no business losing. And yes, I get it. Hockey, anything can happen. They did have a 4-1 lead, all right, 4-2 going into the third. But when you get really 4-2 when you get halfway through the game, because that goal was scored, I believe, with about 10 and a half minutes left to go in the period. So they still had a one-goal lead with half the period to go, and they gagged it up there over the course of a 39-second period. So that's something I will certainly take heed and put on notice here as we move it along. And like I mentioned, are these series, other than the Florida-Boston, which I know is 1-1, could Colorado go in there and win a game number two tonight? Which I believe it is, and we'll go through the schedules for both of the sports over the course of now through the weekend. But for the Stars, can they bounce back in even the series, or is Colorado going to take a 2-0 series lead back to the Rocky Mountains? And also the same could be said for Vancouver, which they'll play tomorrow night, if they could go to Edmonton with a 2-0 series lead. And who knows? Will Carolina get back in the series tonight? Because in the blink of an eye, and that's the first game tonight at 7 o'clock, can they calm down the Ranger power play and stay out of the penalty box, play 5-on-5, five five, because the Rangers aren't great 5-on-5, five five, as we know. Once they have the man advantage, it's almost lights out. And let's see if they could get back in the series. Because between the NBA and the NHL right now, they need some length. Because right now what we've seen so far, and although you have some storylines and good ones at that, Florida-Boston now, thankfully they got back in the series, so we have that. Can Edmonton bounce back from that meltdown yesterday? Dallas tonight, can they get back in the series where they had a three-goal lead in game one? And in the NBA, like I mentioned, can Indiana bounce back? Is there any way Cleveland or Dallas could throw a wrinkle into this postseason and see if they could steal a game? to get the home court advantage. It's all right there, but we will see what's going to happen here over the course of these next few days. NHL tonight, Rangers of Carolina at 7, Colorado, Dallas, TNT. Tomorrow, Florida, Boston at 7, Edmonton, Vancouver at 10, also TNT. And the game's over the weekend, TNT, until you get to Sunday. Florida, Boston, 6.30, Vancouver, Edmonton on TBS. That's Sunday, and it's Saturday, New York, Carolina at 7. Surprised they didn't put that in the afternoon. Maybe because they didn't have the ESPN ABC. I know the NBA will take over here for the next few days. Dallas, Colorado at 10. That is your game three. And then for the NBA, as far as your schedule goes, tonight the double dip, Celtics, Cavs. Then you have Dallas and the Thunder tonight. And one other thing which I didn't mention, because the Nuggets... And Tim Wolves did not play last night. There was a four-game layoff just so they could kind of catch up because, remember, they started their series Saturday night, so now they'll catch up on the series and have their Game 3 on Friday. So tomorrow we have New York, Indiana at 7, followed by Denver, Minnesota at 9.30. Tonight, tomorrow on ESPN. And then you have the ABC games, like I thought, 3.30, OKC, Dallas. And then you have Boston at Cleveland at 8.30. Followed by Sunday, New York, Indiana, 3.30. So that will harken back to the days of NBC in the 90s, if you recall. And then Denver, Minnesota, game four, 8 o'clock on TNT. And real quick, going back to Denver, Minnesota, I think this four-day layoff, because they played Monday night and they're not going to play until tomorrow night, I think this was beneficial for Denver. It's almost as if they could get a reset. It's almost as if they could exhale here. 
The T-Wolves, as we know, they're undefeated so far this postseason. And I get it that the series is now moving to the Twin Cities. But I think this is going to bode well more for Denver to kind of get their bearings. I would think that Mike Malone, the coach, probably told the team Monday night after that game, Tuesday, get away from basketball. We're not meeting. And I don't know if that was the case, but that would be my tact if I was coach. Let's just get away from basketball, decompress, We'll get back on the court early Wednesday morning and start the game plan for Friday night. That would have been my calling if I was the coach. And I would think he knows a lot better than I do. They probably did something of that nature. But for Denver, I think it's going to bode well for them. Where Minnesota, they probably wanted to play Wednesday night because all the momentum, and they still have the momentum, don't get me wrong. But because that creature of habit, freak of nature, where you're playing every other night, and now to have four days off, Maybe that will have the T-Wolves, although at home and their fans will be behind them, but who knows? Maybe the press will be off at Denver. They're not at home. They know what's at stake. They know what they're up against. And maybe they'll steal. Or not, I wouldn't even say steal. Maybe they'll come out and be their champion selves to maybe get a game three, which will then have everybody's eyebrows raised. Let's say they come out of that game 117-101. Then you're going to think differently about the Nuggets going into game four as opposed to them squeaking by and moving on. So that's what I got there with the NBA. Let me pivot as I put on my batting gloves and get into the batter's box to discuss what's happening in baseball. And there are a few things to get into. The first one being, and only because from afar watching them, and now that they've been in the Bronx here the last two nights, and not only did they lose 10-3 on Tuesday night, but they lost 9-4 last night, and they do have one more game left in the series. It is now what, May 9th? The Houston Astros are 12 and 24. They are in last place. And that's with Oakland and the LA Angels. No Shohei, as we know. No Anthony Rendon. All right, big whoop. No Mike Trout. And they are looking up at them in the standings as of right this second. Their team is going nowhere fast. Alex Bregman is a pending free agent as he's going to be one of the top free agents this offseason. Jose Altuve, we know he signed on board. Jordan Alvarez. Kyle Tucker, I believe, is another guy that could be on the verge of free agency. And mind you, in the first two games, he's hit a home run in the first inning of each of these first two games against the New York Yankees. But as of right this second, could we write off the Houston Astros as being a possible playoff team in 2024? And we have not even hit Memorial Day. I'll say no for this reason. And it's not the reasons that you would probably even think or expect. No, it's not what they've done here over the last half dozen years. No, it's not the championship medal, DNA, everything that I like to talk about teams that have won before or have been to ALCSs in their case over the last six years and making it to the World Series four times or seven years, I think, dating back to now 2016. But how I look at the American League... It's Baltimore, New York, Yankees that is. Whoever's going to come out of the AL, and I'll say Cleveland for right this moment, the AL West is still a toss-up. And even though the Astros are eight and a half games back as of right now, it is not insurmountable, especially in that division. Now, if there was a team that was about to run away and hide, if you could tell me that right this second, then I'll tell you, oh, they have no shot for the division, and maybe for a wild card, we'll have to wait and see. And it's way too even early. Even if I pull up the standings for the wild card, I mean, that'd be a joke right now here as we're, what, six weeks into the baseball season? But the, and there's seven in the loss. So even though they're eight and a half back in the division, there's seven in the loss behind the Texas Rangers. So I can't count them out just yet because they could still get in as a six seed in the American League playoff picture. And just for grins and giggles, I'll even pull up the wild card standings if I can even do that on this day. So what we have here is the Astros, they're actually closer to the division than they are in the wild card. By a half game, all right, I understand that. And you have the Royals currently tied, even though they're percentage points behind the Twins for the final wild card playoff spot. I can't believe I'm even bringing this up right now. But the Royals, do you expect them to be in the thick of things when it's all said and done? Chances are maybe not, but you never know. They could be the Marlins of this year when you think about it. 
or the Marlins of last year, Marlins of this year, oof, you can pretty much put them out to sea. The 2023 Marlins, who made it to the postseason, as we know, but for the Astros, they are nine back in the wild card and eight and a half back, seven in the loss behind the Texas Rangers. So for the Astros, I can't count them out just yet. As much as I want to start throwing dirt on them, they've certainly put themselves, and I understand I'm using this analogy, and maybe I shouldn't use this, but I'm just going to throw it out there. What the hell? They've already dug themselves six feet under, but the dirt has not been thrown out on them. And again, we could talk about what they've done here since 2015. We could talk about what they've done throughout the course of even this decade from 2020 on. The World Series appearances, winning a World Series two years ago, I get it. But with this team and how they performed, and they even had to send Jose Abreu, their first baseman, who I thought was an excellent signing, when he left the Chicago White Sox and signed a three-year deal with the Astros. He's been an abomination. He's in the minor, minor leagues. is too strong because that means he'd be sent down. They had to send him to their spring training complex to kind of get him fixed. And Justin Verlander... He got bombed the other night. The most earned runs he's given up since he was a Detroit Tiger. Think about that. His ERA is four and a half. He's one and one because remember, he was on the shelf to start off the year. But Justin Verlander, this is the last year of his contract. He's going to have to think long and hard that this may be it for him. And Framber Valdez has been in and out of the rotation. And Jose Urquidy. This team is a far cry from what we've known and have watched the Houston Astros perform here. I will say this, right this very second, I can't throw dirt on them just yet, but I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs this year. And you know what I'm going to say? What the hell? I don't think they're going to make the playoffs this year. If they're going to continue to play like this, now they may have a run in them. We get it. They'll probably be at some point in the summer where they're going to have to win 16 of 21 or some crazy clip like that. But what I've seen here from this Astro team, they have not gotten out of their own way. They're about to get swept by the Yankees again. And remember, they started the year getting swept by the Yanks. So the Astros, I don't want to hear that Mexico City, they won the two games against Colorado, but whoop, Colorado's one of the worst teams in the sport. Or they did well against this team or that team. They have not strung any consistency whatsoever. They're playing 333 baseball. How do I think it's going to all of a sudden turn around? And I know the barometer is Memorial Day. Once you get to that point, you could say, all right, let's see where these teams are at. Is it going to get any better between now and what's Memorial Day? May 27th? I can't see that. And you know what? Again, grins and giggles. Let's look at their schedule. And I understand you can't just predicate it on that because we all know teams go through these stretches. But look at the Twins. They just won, what was it, 12 in a row, but they beat up the... White Sox for seven games, and in between that, the Angels, and they even beat the Red Sox for those first two games. I get it. But anything can happen. But let's just take a look here. After this, they go to Detroit for three games, and Detroit has been eh, but they're over 500. Now they have Oakland coming into that building for four starting Monday. So if they're going to turn their season around, maybe there, but Oakland's playing pretty well for Oakland. In fact, they're in third place. Like I mentioned, they're looking up at them in the standings. And then they have Milwaukee coming into town. They have the Angels. And then after that, leading into Memorial Day weekend, they're at Oakland. So I guess these games, and I kind of wish, or maybe they wish that they had the imbalanced schedule where they could play the A's and the Angels 19 times. Well, if they're not going to turn it around here after they play the Yankees today, all right, they could lose two out of three in Detroit, four against Oakland. As of right now, who knows? They may split against them, which will be nothing. Then Milwaukee, then they have the Angels coming in, so they have a long homestand before going to Oakland into the Memorial Day weekend, and then on Memorial Day, play Seattle to start of four games there. Let's see what they do once we get to Memorial Day, and we'll take a look at the Astros at that point. Other than that, you had some big news. The Pirates, they bring up their number one pick from last year, Paul Skeens, the big, tall right-hander, a lot of comparisons to Steven Strasburg. Hopefully, he doesn't have that type of career where he's going to be on the shelf a lot, and Tommy John and thoracic outlet syndrome, and I'm sure even if you're skiing, it's not that you want to take that route, but we know Strasburg was a World Series MVP and did win a ring, and obviously made a ton of money off of that World Series, where he got the big-time contract, seven years, $240 million, but 
only had a handful of starts from that time they won the World Series till he retired last year. But for Skeens, a guy that is coming in, maybe not as ballyhooed as Steven Strasburg, but a guy that is comparable, the height, the arsenal, the repertoire. So I don't know when his first start is going to be. I don't know when his last start in AAA was. I'm sure it's probably going to be over the course of these next four days. So you know I'm going to monitor that and see how his first start's going to go. And I will say this, not to even compare the two pitchers by any stretch, but when the Mets brought up Kristen Scott, who is their prize pro prospect from AAA, and I was shocked. Six in the third inning, 94 pitches. Let's hope that Derek Shelton, the manager of the Pirates, has him go more than whatever it is, 70, 75 pitches. Let the guy spread his wings a little bit. Now, if he gets bombed, then you're going to have to pull him. I understand that. But... You can only hope that his first start, which I'm sure they're going to want to get his first start in Pittsburgh, but he's going to want to have the fans come out. They want to try to sell the building. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of hype surrounding his first start in PNC Park. But for Skeens, let him go. He's in the big leagues for a reason. Let him go six innings. Let him throw 80, 85, 90 pitches, similar to what Scott did. And let's see how the outcome will fall so that's one thing to keep an eye on I'm looking forward to seeing what his first start's going to be like and speaking of pitchers Chris Sale last night against his former team and teammates in the Boston Red Sox and he's had a great start to his year five and one ERA under three last night six innings didn't give up a run struck out 10 walked one six hits in the process Chris Sale is he all the way back from what happened there with the Tommy John all the injuries over the last couple of years there in Boston Quite possibly, and that is a big lift for the Braves, considering that Spencer Strider is on the shelf with Tommy John in his own right. Max Fried, a guy, as we all know, going into his walk year, and he's going to want to show and prove, and I believe he's done pretty well so far. And with Marcelo Zuna, how about him? A guy that I'm sure the Brave fan wanted out on the rail with that alleged domestic violence incident a couple of years back and poor production last year. Well, he's batting 315 and he's leading the major leagues. In home runs and RBIs. So you know he's got a lot to prove. And I'm sure he's going into a walk here himself. So obviously he's probably playing for one last contract. I understand with the owners, buyer beware. Because if you do that, are you going to get similar production to what you're getting in Ozuna now? And he's a good offensive player. But he has certainly been hot and cold here over the last couple of years. Wearing a brave uniform. But now he is hot as a pistol. So we'll get to see what the Braves are going to do here. And as we take a look at the standings, the Phillies are still in first place. Slim as some margins, I understand. But the two games, in fact, but they're tied in the loss because the Braves actually have a handful of games in hand over the Phillies. So that's why you have them tied for first, but the Phillies have played four more games. But everything is pretty much status quo throughout Major League Baseball. Nothing else to really look at. I know the Yankees have won five in a row thanks to the Astros coming to town, and then they swept the Tigers over the weekend. But the Orioles, who they in their own right have two games in hand over the Yankees, that's why they're in first place by percentage points, as they are 24 and 12. The Yankees are 25 and 13, and the Phillies have the most wins in the sport at 26. But that's what you have there. As a matter of fact, they're tied with the Dodgers. They've also have 26 wins, 26 and 13. They've won seven in a row. Now you got to wonder whether or not the Dodgers are going to be clicking on all cylinders. Yamamoto, I get it, was against the Marlins. He gave up two solo home runs, but he pitched eight innings and has actually done well since his first couple of starts. He's 5-1 and one with an ERA under three in his own right, so maybe the Dodgers will now take off and hide in the NL West. I know the Padres with Dylan Cease coming back to Chicago, shutting out the Cubs there yesterday, striking out 12 in the process. And, of course, they got Luis Arise last week in that trade, which I killed the Marlins. Why are they in business, as we all know? But that's what I have with the baseball. Let's take a look at to see what's going to shape up for the schedule over the weekend. Any series of note that I could expound on here. You have series concluding with Seattle, Minnesota today. We talked about New York and the Astros. Yankees, of course. Cleveland, Chicago. I don't know if that's the first of four. That is so. So the Guardians will play the White Sox. Let's see if they beat up on them to pad their lead in the AL Central. St. Louis, Milwaukee, is that a four-gamer? Yep, that's a four-gamer in the Brew City. But for the weekend itself, Cubs at Pirates, eh, Houston, Detroit, we talked about. 
Yankees in Tampa. Let's see if the Tampa Bay Rays could do what they did to the Mets, the other New York team, as they swept them last weekend. Arizona at Baltimore. Minnesota, Toronto. Braves playing the Mets this weekend, so that's going to be interesting. Here I'm talking about the Braves, how's the pistol, or at least with sale, and them tied for first. Well, they're going to invade New York, so huh, let's see how that goes. And the Mets were rained out there on yesterday and have a day off today, so they haven't played since Tuesday when the Braves come to town tomorrow, so just keep that in mind. Philly at Miami, so you would think that they're going to continue to be in first place when it's all said and done as they hit South Beach or really Brickle or Little Havana, you know what I mean. That's pretty much it. Texas, Colorado, Kansas City at the Angels. Ugh. Dodgers, Padres, there you go. That's going to be a good series with those two clubs. Dodgers, they already played them earlier this year, and I believe, let me take a look. I forgot off the top of my head what happened in that series. Yeah, actually, the Padres won two out of three in that middle game. I know got a little contentious with some brushbacks, so let's see what's going to happen in that series as the Dodgers will go down the turnpike to play the Padres over the weekend. That's pretty much a series of notes, and I would believe that would probably be the Sunday night game, wouldn't it? Uh, let's take a look at that real quick. Sunday night, we'll have ESPN. No, it's actually Braves and Mets. Ugh. Severino against Bryce Elder is your matchup there. So that's what you have. And then you have Max Reed, in fact, pitching against Christian Scott tomorrow, or Saturday, I should say. So that's a series, oh, that's a game that the Met fan will look at because Scott, of course, got his first game in Tampa, as we know. And then you have tomorrow night where the series will kick off. Charlie Morton against Jose Quintana, who got bombed in his last outing there uh, in St. Louis on Monday, I believe. Was that the case? No, I may have that wrong. That was in Tampa. That was the 10-7 game where he gave up uh, eight runs there in, the, in his last start. Other than that, people, what else do I have? NFL, you had a couple of fringe signings. Tyler Boyd going to the Tennessee Titans. And then there was another signing. Nothing really to get crazy about. If you're talking NFL, you know it's going to quiet down until the schedule is released, which I believe is a week from today. So we'll keep that in mind as we get closer. Well, Allen Robinson, who was a Steeler, remember, went drafted by Jacksonville, had some big years there. The Giants signed him to a one-year deal, so nothing really to get crazy about when it comes to the NFL. Nothing on the docket for golf. A week from today, you do have the PGA, so we'll talk about that next week. The Monday after that, the French Open begins, the second major of tennis this year, where you have the second major of golf next week. Indy 500 is a week or two weeks from this coming Sunday, so you got a lot of sports still Kicking up as we get through this month. Obviously, the playoffs are going to get us through as well as Major League Baseball. But that is it, my good people. Another episode just about the books. Thank you so much for stopping by. From the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you carving out precious time out of your day to listen to what it is I have to say about what goes on in the world of sports. If you haven't done so, like I mentioned at the top, please subscribe, rate, and review. Throw me a few stars. Write a review. Also on YouTube, at J Reels. Please subscribe there, like, leave a comment, tell your friends, foes, enemies, frenemies, you name it, family, about what it is that I'm doing as a full-time content creator, people. So please, if you could do that, I would greatly appreciate it. If you want to hit me up with a question, comment, suggestion, you could do so at the following on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, The J Reels Podcast. Also, live stream every Wednesday on my J Reels Instagram account. I will pivot along the lines and move to YouTube once I get my 1,000 subscribers, etc. So stay tuned for that. But on Instagram, every Wednesday, 12 noon Eastern, live stream, I talk about anything, not even just sports. So if you want to just chime in, say hello, listen to some music, whatever, please do so. On Twitter, xjreels1, just the number, the old-fashioned way, the J Reels podcast at gmail.com. I'll be more than happy to follow up with you guys and gals because whether you do or do not know, this is what I love to do, people. It's in the blood, it's in the DNA. As I always say, sports since birth, where else are you going to get all these sports? In one hour, and this is a tidy hour, as I'm getting 58 minutes right now, but of course with all the other addendums at the top, where else are you going to get all this in one hour? The fire, passion, energy, fury coming from my voice into this microphone with my thoughts, opinions, critiques, praise, analysis, feelings on anything and everything. That happens on the world of the diamond, ice, gridiron, hardwood, golf course, racetrack, tennis court, boxing ring, octagon, you name it. From my lips to your ears, from my heart to your soul, from where I am to wherever you are, the J Reels Podcast always comes correct, direct, and in full effect. 
from the South Bronx, the South Beach, the South Center, the South Pacific, and all points beyond. Peace, love, and God bless everybody. And until next time on the J Reels Podcast, on the flip, baby.